Hey everybody, this is Parker here. We're going to go over uh, my presentation on Mildred Gosling's Fenton reaction. So in this presentation, what I hope to achieve is give a brief biography on Mildred Gosling so you could get some insight into the character that was Mildred, uh, try to understand what she was going through when she helped develop the Fenton reaction, uh, the reaction itself, why we still use it, how the mechanism is carried out of the reaction, what reactions that we've gone over in the course uh, are similar to it, and why and how it's still used today and is recognized as um, critically important to organic chemists. So to start off with Mildred Gosling, it's important to recognize that from a young age, she always wanted to go into research of some kind towards the scientific community at large. She comes from a medical family. Her father was a dentist. She always knew that she wanted to uh, follow a similar career path. So what she does is she goes to Royal Holloway College, uh, where she receives a bachelor's, a first class bachelor's, which is kind of an antiquated term, uh, turns out to be sort of like an honors or top of the class equivalent of um, her degree. So she gets that bachelor's in chemistry. Uh, because of her great grades, is awarded a studentship, another antiquated term, uh, which is the equivalent today's uh, kind of like a post back internship. So through this internship, she goes to Newnham College, which is kind of an adjacent uh, offshoot of Cambridge University. She does that for two years towards the turn of the century. She then returns back to Royal Holloway College. Uh, where she becomes a lab demonstrator. Once again, kind of an antiquated term, but what she would basically do is sort of like the um, the lab coordinator of today or kind of like a chemistry lab professor where she would carry out experiments for undergraduate students to then have them duplicate the experiment. She would help undergraduate students with their own experiments. Um, there would be other post-bachelor uh, studentship students in there doing their own independent studies and research that she would help oversee. She'd keep the lab clean, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. A little less research focused, but it's important to recognize that all throughout, she was still carrying out research of her own. Throughout this time, one thing leads to another. She meets um, a chemistry lecturer known as William Hobson Mills. He had been doing his own thing at Cambridge University uh, when they had met. They, they hit it off, they get married, um, Mildred ends up having four children with him, retires from professional chemistry. Uh, some of her children, some of her daughters, more importantly, become chemists themselves, uh, and Gosling passes away in 1962. It's important to recognize that we don't really have any documented photographs of, of Mildred Gosling. We don't have any illustrations of what she may have looked like, anything of the sort. But what we do have, uh, which could kind of help to peer into the insight that she may have had, is this photograph here of what her study at Royal Holloway would have looked like and where she would have uh, tried publishing some of her uh, work and what it would have looked like for her. Again, down at the bottom right of the slide, you could see what one of the laboratories would have looked like, sort of an artist's interpretation of what a classic turn of the century, turn of the 20th century labs would have looked like that she would have been the demonstrator for. So she was actually a pioneer in more ways than one. Being a female chemist at the time, somewhat uncommon, especially for a chemist of her caliber uh, that would go on to publish many things. So she ended up being one of 19 who would write to the Chem Society uh, in, for the country in sort of what would be a petition that would state that her and many of her female colleagues' work was seen as illegitimate or not as comprehensive as male compatriots' work would have been. Uh, they didn't consider it to be uh, to the same standard, so it wouldn't receive equivalent feedback. Um, publishing rights would be given at a much slower rate. The uh, peer review for such publications, if you were a woman chemist at the time, wasn't exactly to the same standard as if you were a male. Uh, so her and 18 other female chemists at the time end up writing a petition to the Chemical Society, where they then, uh, because of this petition, started an initiative for equal representation in the scientific community. 
Uh, so not even just for chemists and the chemical society, but all research of all kinds. So she is kind of seen as a female uh, chemist pioneer and female science pioneer for the most part, which is very interesting to hear. Uh, so she um, actually, to, to take a step back, prior to meeting um, the person she studied with in her studentship, uh, was performing organic chemistry herself. Um, this is during her, her bachelor's years at Royal Holloway. She had been doing research uh, on carbohydrates, which is sort of rudimentary to what we would be studying nowadays. Um, but for back then, it was seen as uh, sort of progressive to be doing organic chemistry, let alone any form of chemistry for a woman. So during her studentship, which is where things really kick off for Mildred, uh, she meets Henry Fenton. Um, they end up publishing multiple papers together. Um, and the name's starting to sound a little bit familiar for Mr. Fenton uh, as he develops the reagent known as the Fenton reagent. But uh, these papers that they publish together end up coining the term the Fenton reaction. And because of her status as a woman, it could be seen retroactively that even some papers that Henry published later on that uh, Mildred may not have been present intentionally because she was a woman. Um, but it is important to to go back and recognize that there were papers that they had published together and a majority of his most important arguably most important work uh was present and co-published by mildred gosling so like i said in the last slide the fenton reagent was synthesized by henry fenton uh prior to meeting uh mildred gosling but the reagent itself is really more of a blanket term as there is no exact chemical compound formula for the Fenton reagent. What the Fenton reagent really ends up being, uh, which, you know, is kind of synonymous to the Fenton reaction, is some form of an iron catalyst. So some form of carbon compound that contains iron in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. That's really what makes the Fenton reaction the Fenton reaction. So if there's some form of uh, iron organic compound or even a inorganic compound with iron, which is more likely what you'll find in, in nature. Um, these iron, including inorganic compounds in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, will carry out this reaction that results in the presence of water or with water as a byproduct. Um, it, it kind of fits under the umbrella term of advanced oxidation, where advanced oxidation aims to um, remove an oxygen from this ferrous inorganic compound and will eventually uh, make a byproduct of water, either in a single or multi-stepped equation. So this advanced oxidation really is sort of a process um, of water purification in a way. So it removes um, inorganic compounds from either water or soil or any other form of substrate where it otherwise would be unable to be removed. So it's kind of uh, used today mostly as some form of uh, decontaminant, as some form of waste management, of some form of water purification, something of that sort. So this Fenton reagent becomes known as an oxidant over time, uh, which is then used to, of course, decontaminate water. So uh, this here uh, below on the bottom right, shown to be from 2020 is a new known as electrofenton process where the fenton reaction is carried out you could see there the uh, iron two with the two positives there uh, in the presence of hydrogen peroxide will make a, an iron with three positive and a free radical hydroxyl there known as an organic pollutant those organic pollutants are over the course of the reaction pushed out and made into the byproduct of water or oxygen. Those water or oxygens could then be isolated, which is where you end up getting that water purification process from. Here they're using an anode and a cathode to carry out the reaction sort of in an electrochemical uh, approach, but for the sake of the reaction that I'm going to carry out and for the sake of the Fenton reaction that you traditionally see, um, the reaction isn't carried out electrochemically, it's carried out just through um, organic chemistry and through the use of uh, oxygen-containing reagents. So here, 
you could see the Fenton reaction in its most simplest form. Like I just said, those hydroxyl free radicals that you could see in that electro Fenton reaction down below on the last slide, um, those hydroxyl free radicals are always going to be included as well as, of course, that ferrous compound and the presence of hydrogen peroxide. That's kind of what makes the Fenton reaction the Fenton reaction. Um, iron could also, once again, important, uh, can be presented in, in many different forms. So it can be in an organic compound, an inorganic compound. As long as iron is contained within the compound, it can be considered eligible uh, for the Fenton reaction especially when hydrogen peroxide, or only, I should say, only when hydrogen peroxide is present. And it's also important to check the ionic charge of the iron. So you could see in that first line there that the iron has a two plus charge. So when the iron with a two plus charge is reacted with hydrogen peroxide, you could see on the right side of the reaction that the iron uh, gains a plus one charge. So it becomes iron three positive, and then there's that hydroxyl radical and that negatively charged hydroxyl group there. So you can see there that there's your hydroxyl radical that you'll see in the mechanism that I drew out on the next slide. Um, that comes into play during a multi-step reaction of the Fenton reaction. During single step, it's important to consider that the hydroxyl radical may already be present in solution. Uh, that is sometimes the case especially considering um, organic compounds and in inorganic substrate, uh, you could see hydroxyl radicals kind of free flowing in solution sometimes, especially in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. And uh, it's also shown through the uh, second line there of the reaction. I'm sorry, the third line of the reaction in the second list there of reaction. So you could see that the, um, hydrogen peroxide and hydroxyl free radical will then make uh, two HO2 with a free radical there and the byproduct of water. So that would kind of be the last step there of the Fenton reaction. It's also important to recognize that even when there's two hydrogen peroxide and no ferrous compound, there still will be a hydroxyl radical formed. Um, this kind of indicates once again that in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, there will always be a hydroxyl radical present uh, for that multi-step process. So even in a case where uh, the ferrous compound isn't present, uh, you'll still have those hydroxyl radicals. So once the ferrous compound is presented, whether it has two or three uh, positive ionic charge on that iron, uh, there still will be a Fenton reaction carried out with a byproduct of water. That's the key takeaway. So you'll have to excuse my kind of rudimentary drawing here of uh, what I made the reaction mechanism. This is the real meat and potatoes of the Fenton reaction here. So as you could see on the left side, I started with a ferrous compound uh, containing an oxygen within compound. A, a two plus charge there on the iron. We'll keep that in charge as well and keep that at the back of our heads there. And I also drew in a hydrogen peroxide below that. I used tosylate as the first react, uh, reagent just because tosylate helps with that um, oxidation and the addition of the hydrogen peroxide to the iron. And you could see that with that green arrow uh, presentation there, which can be seen in the single step equation. In a multi-step, you may not need to use tosylate. Uh, I used the green to indicate a single step equation, a single step Fenton reaction. The red pen, which you'll most likely see happening in, uh, you know, in, in natural conditions, um, that's going to be your multi-step. And so that's what you'll most likely see carried out in, in a lab setting or in natural really is the multi-step where you'll get to use those hydroxyl free radicals more often, which of course you could see down in the second step. So to get to that second step, uh, you could see that the, through the use of tosylate, uh, the hydrogen peroxide attached a hydroxyl group to the iron. The iron became Fe3 plus instead of Fe2 plus. And then you could see that hydroxyl radical on the uh, right side there by the attached hydroxyl to the iron. That green arrow there indicates that one of the iron's electrons will be transferred down to the hydroxyl group, 
and that oxygen hydrogen bond is going to be split between that oxygen and iron bond and the hydroxyl free radical. So that hydroxyl free radical gets detached. Because it grabs that hydrogen, it becomes a byproduct of water, which you could see as the plus H2O in green. There's your water byproduct. In that single step, you could see that the iron actually becomes a 4, Fe4 from Fe3. So it just keeps gaining charge. Since the bond is shared between oxygen and iron on both sides, so from the iron side and from that hydroxyl side, what had previously been hydroxyl anyway, it becomes a double bonded oxygen to the iron. The free radical of hydroxyl ends up taking off the oxygen from the backside and making another byproduct of water. So there's no oxygen and is instead added an offshoot there, which you could see on the right side of the compound. Uh, for the multi-step equation, it's kind of easier to see where this offshoot comes from as the uh, oxygen is a little bit more clearly detached on that right side of the compound. So for the multi-step compound, you can see that the iron, the Fe3+, plus, uh, goes all the way across the compound to attach to the oxygen. Now, one of those hydrogens that's bonded to the oxygen, uh, that oxygen-hydrogen bond goes to the free radical. So that intermediate one there with the free radical of hydroxyl is going to be there um, whether you're doing a single or multi-step. So it's important to know that that um, free radical hydroxyl uh, is integral to making sure that the um, Fenton reaction is carried out. So as you could see in, the net, in that intermediate step down there, that the iron becomes an iron four, and a hydroxyl group is attached to that iron, that same one. That is shown with the green arrows, ends up happening with red arrows and a free flowing water molecule is also present. Once again, going back to the previous slide, there's gonna be a byproduct of water, as we said, without the presence of a ferrous compound or not. So in a multi-step version of the Fenton reaction, that water's gonna end up being used to the advantage of the Fenton reaction. So that water is gonna have um, one of its hydrogen bound to the uh, two free electrons on the hyd on the oxygen there uh, on the far right side of the uh, ferrous compound because that other oxygen and hydrogen bond went to the hydroxyl free radical. So that oxygen in that red pen you could see grabs onto that hydrogen of the water molecule there and the oxygen also grabs onto the hydrogen on the other end that's attached to the hydroxyl group with the iron. That bond is also split at the oxygen and hydrogen bond there at that iron, which will then just result in the same result as the single step. So you'll have a double bonded oxygen to that, high, that iron, excuse me, and there will be a byproduct of water. Now, in either case, as denoted by either red or green, you could see that there's going to be a water byproduct. And that's what's really applied when it comes down to the practical use of the Fenton reaction in today's day and age. So functionally, you could see that there are similar reactions to what we've covered throughout the course. Um, you could see that hydroxylation comes into play. Um, there's even sometimes if you wanted to go back to um, benzenes, uh, you could put a phenol. Uh, so the uh, conversion of a benzene to a phenol, which is a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group attached. Uh, the Haber-Weiss reaction, which we'll talk about in a second. And even elimination reactions, which we touched on recently, are all sort of similar. So hydroxylations, where you induce a hydroxyl group through an oxidation reaction, um, oxidizes a, a carbon to hydroxyl bond, uh, which you could see throughout the equation, the Fenton reaction, that this oxidation is carried out repeatedly. So that hydroxyl free radical really goes to exemplify hydroxylation in the Fenton reaction, right? So without that hydroxyl group, that free radical, um, Hydroxylation would even be carried out. And hydroxylation happens in all types of uh, organic compound reactions. So that's, that's definitely a key tenant to this reaction that is carried over to hundreds of other organic reactions. Conversion of benzene to phenol, another organic, uh, takes place with 
benzenes, which are not necessarily um, excluded from being involved in the Fenton reaction. There are certainly organic compounds uh, that iron is part of the ferrous compound, has a benzene group attached. Um, of course, the, the mechanism of the reaction that I showed was sort of a simplification, so I didn't really use a benzene ring. Um, but during the process of changing a benzene to a phenol, you can use ferric chloride or some of the ferrous intermediate, and that actually goes through the Fenton reaction in a way it's very similar. Uh, it uses the oxidation, and in the grand scheme, it actually hydroxylizes that benzene ring uh, through the use of iron. So it does kind of sort of come through a similar mechanism, certainly not identical, but very similar, relies on that presence of the free oxygen radical yet again through ferric chloride, that FeCl3, if you recall, um, that's extremely important uh, for the conversion of benzene to a phenol and is also uh, deeply similar to the Fenton reaction from a uh, high oxygen radical perspective. So the Haber-Weiss reaction um, basically shows that in the presence of a ferrous compound, mostly Fe2+, plus, um, so that, that second ionic charge of iron, peroxide actually gets reduced into two hydroxides. So it's one free radical hydroxide and one negatively charged hydroxide. Uh, so especially, or I should say, essentially what it is, is it's the reverse of the Fenton reaction. So if we go back a couple slides, uh, you could see that long list of, of reactions for the Fenton reactions. And you could actually see that if you take peroxide in the presence of iron, um, regardless of how it's carried out, there will always be that hydroxyl free radical, right? Which I had mentioned, you, you will get that regardless. So if you have no um, hydrogen peroxide, or if you have no ferrous compound, uh, it may not be reduced, but in the Haber-Weiss equation, um, if there's uh, no iron produced, um, it'll still be reduced. So those two hydroxides uh, actually stay as hydroxides. It's also important to note, uh, and they don't end up turning into a byproduct with water. It's just the two hydroxides. It's, it's basically an inverse of the Fenton reaction, and that'll be used in sort of similar circumstances to the Fenton reaction, but in reverse. And uh, the last reaction that I found to be most similar, this was actually the one that I found was almost uh, displayed in the mechanism that I showed, would be uh, elimination reactions, namely E1 reactions. So they eliminate that initial structure uh, through the use of water as a reagent and a hydroxyl radical, right? So that hydroxyl free radical, of course, being shown, and, and I almost sound like a broken record talking about it because it's so integral to the Fenton reaction. So in an E1 reaction, you're getting that elimination off, uh, the structure changes, hydroxyl radicals present, and water is a reagent. And as you could see through the multi-step equation, that water is used as a reagent. So an E1 reaction is carried out. So for the reaction advantages, right? So what makes the Fenton reaction so advantageous? Why even bother using it? Well, to put it simply, um, peroxide, you could get it in your kitchen cabinet. I mean, you could find peroxide anywhere. It's a very easily attainable reagent. And ferrous compounds, also very common, chemically speaking. Iron is a very common metal. It's one of the most common metals. And it's also one of the most common seen in contaminated water. So that practical uh, use of the Fenton reaction keeps it being advantageous and applicable in all sorts of scientific applications. All sorts of water purification and waste management to this day actually uses the Fenton reaction. So I actually have been uh, doing a little bit of work for um, one of my environmental science courses simultaneously. And I was actually able to do a case study not too long ago about uh, India and their waste management and how their water is contaminated because of such poor waste management practices. So what they've actually been trying to do over in India, uh, which we'll go into in a second with our uh, similar reactions and some of the reactions and, and, and research that's been carried out recently, uh, is they've been using the Fenton reaction as a means of getting ferrous compounds out of water to decontaminate the water and turn it to um, return it to the environment. 
as a means of uh, clean drinking water and clean water for uh, surrounding ecosystems around these highly uh, urbanized areas. So it's actually really cool to see that the Fenton reaction uh, carries over into uh, practical use and out of the lab. Uh, and, and I think it's just so neat that even something as obscure as something as uh, the Fenton reaction in organic chemistry can be used by a broad spectrum of research and in a broad application of water purification. Something that you might think may be uh, inorganic, but really comes down to being one of the most important organic reactions when it comes down to uh, safe drinking water, something that's needed throughout the entire world. So in recent use here, you could see from this study in 2017, a little further back than I typically use for studies. However, I did find that this one was so neat and so applicable to the Fenton reaction, why we use it. Um, they used green tea organic compounds that's, that's found in the, the tea uh, extract, really, to conserve this uh, human gamma B crystalline uh, structures, these, these different protein strands that are found within the eye um, as a means to keep them from oxidizing. So through Fenton's reagent and ultraviolet light, what will happen is basically cataracts are formed. Uh, so through ultralight, or I'm sorry, ultraviolet exposure um, over time, your eyes develop cataracts. But what they found was through using Fenton's reaction uh, in the presence of um, those hydrogen peroxide and ferrous compounds, uh, what they could do is they could actually keep the protein intact through use of uh, these green tea organic compounds known as uh, polyphenols. So uh, what they do really is the cataracts in the eye, they can essentially either be prevented altogether or they could even be treated through these compounds. So what you could see down below chemically going on, you could see that good old hydroxyl free radical right there in the reagent. So you've got tryptophan on the left there and then through uh, the use of a hydroxyl free radical through the Fenton reaction, you could see that that tryptophan turns into uh, n chiironine which is a pretty common uh, organo compound. So what it does is it adds that hydroxyl group to that uh, double bonded oxygen there where that amine group is added. Uh, you could see that um, there's also some other addition going on there. The structure kind of changes up a little bit. That pentene there changes. Um, so that addition of the free radical hydroxyl group changes tryptophan into something entirely different. And I think that's what helps contribute to uh, keeping the protein intact rather than oxidizing it. Overall, I think clinically, which is kind of where my background lies, this is a really interesting use of the Fenton reaction. Now, another reaction that I found, which is a lot more recent, this is in 2021, kind of a little bit offshoot of the uh, Fenton reaction, but you could see there, there's that ferric uh, compound right there, that, that Fe3 with uh, an, oxy, uh, an oxygen containing group there, uh, that ferric oxalate on as atmospheric oxidation. Um, so what they did is they actually had a, an environmental approach to the Fenton reaction, where once again, the exposure to ultraviolet light or, or some form of um, solar exposure really causes the breakdown of some environmental, uh, for lack of a better word, um, atmospheric compounds. So what happens is the effects of these, these um, Fenton-like reactions of ferric oxalate, they actually have been shown to um, conserve atmospheric oxidation processes rather than carry out this oxidation at a faster rate, kind of like what happens in the eye with the cataracts, they're able to use sort of a, in the form of an aqueous aerosol, uh, sort of not reverse the oxidative process of these atmospheric compounds, but keep them from advancing as quickly as it could be. So here's our references. I was running out of time on my recording. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope that you've learned a little bit more about the Fenton reaction.